Right. Um, hello. Right. I'm. I'm. Oh, that's all right. That's. Hang on. Where are we? That, that's it. Right. That's me. I used to work for the trust. I'm not part of the trust anymore. Um, so I apologise, poor old Mike. There. <laughs> <laughs> he has to cope with me moving around all the place, away all the moving around all the time. So. Um, uh, and uh, I, yeah, I used to work for the trust, but now I um, do some stuff at UEA, and uh, I run three IT companies who are medicine orientated. One of the things we run is the Choice of Medication website, which you may be familiar, and if you're not, I'll tell you about it later. Uh, I always put my declarations of interest up to start with, just to prove that when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry, I am a complete mm. tart. <laughs> but I'm not a prostitute, so I don't change anything I say just because someone's asked me to do a talk or whatever. Um, but if you, I, I figure if you do a little bit for every company, then you're biased towards all of them. And hence, none of them. So. <laughs> Uh, and also, I do all that lot there, and I'm, I mean, this is entirely my own free time. Not even get petrol money. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, you know, it works out that even. Uh, yeah. Nice balance of things. So uh, the cunning plan was to do a bit on drugs on ADHD, a little bit on autistic spectrum disorder. But since drugs don't really particularly help that much, I think the ADHD thing is. Um, probably more important. So I'll go through some of the drugs, Pat's mentioned melatonin, some of the other treatments. Uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along or ask at the end. And since I thought I had three quarters an hour instead of now 25 minutes, I'll better get on with it and I might miss a few slides out. <coughs> what I would say, it's sort of echoing what uh, John Wilson said at the beginning, is that my interest is in getting medicines right. If we can get medicines right, everything else falls into place. If you get medicines wrong, then it's difficult for all the other things that, to, to help to work if you're uh, uh, being screwed up by drugs. So I would think there's three ways, the three ways of, of, of helping somebody. There's self-help, so help the person helping themselves, reducing their risks of things occurring, uh, um, self-managing their symptoms. Uh, there's help from others, so being taught how to do things, learning how to do things. And then there are medications which can help control the symptoms and manage them. So, you know, you know, diabetes is an example. You know, diabetes, <coughs> insulin is vital. But insulin is only part of it. You have to know how to use insulin, so somebody needs to teach you how to do it. And then you have to self-manage yourself to know how much insulin to give way and what, what to eat and so on. <coughs> uh, I, I often wonder whether it's a little bit like a sort of three-legged chair. If you've got self-help, help from others, and some medication, then that's quite stable, and you can sit on that with care. Um, if you've only got two legs on that, so you've taken one of them away, you know, you can do it and you can get yourself nice and you can get yourself stable, but it can be a bit wobbly and could struggle on occasion. And if you've only got one stool, one leg on your stool, that is quite tricky. It can be done, but you can be quite vulnerable. Um, so I think it's, a, it's often a combination of the three. And the other thing I would say is that, of course, if you're sat on a three-legged stool and somebody whips one of those stool legs away very quickly, then the chances are you'll fall over. So I always think everything should be started slowly and stopped slowly. So you don't just say, right, I've had enough of this drug, I'm going to stop it now. You know, come off it gently, let your brain get used to it, treat the drug with respect and treat your brain with respect. Of course, the other way of looking at it is, is your therapy will combination of drugs and clowns. <laughs> so let's go through... Um, the important thing is, you know, the brain is the most important organ we've got. I think we probably all agree on that. Yeah, well, that is according to the brain, anyway. <laughs> it makes up the <laughs> um, ADHD can be highly advantageous for people. This is a short list of people who are well-known and popular, um, who are known to either have ADHD or have had it. Um, so, I mean, there are some, you know, Paris Hilton's probably one of the best, the best known ones. I mean, she is... Uh, quite serious ADHD. She's currently treated with one well, of the amphetamines. Um, it's true. She's on this amphetamine and has been for some years. Sorry, I think I mean, <laughs> imagine her lifestyle might have a lot of amphetamine. <laughs> uh, um, so it's one of those things that it, it's it, you know if you've got a bit of the symptoms, um, then you know if you can channel them in the right direction, it's highly advantageous. But it's when they become beyond that and stop you being able to function that's when it becomes a problem. Um, I, I, was, I suppose Ozzy Osbourne is an English rock musician, but I was the musician was probably taking it perhaps a bit far. Uh, <laughs> just making myself popular here. Um, 
<coughs> so, an example of ADHD is by the time I think what I'm going to do, I've already done it. It's, uh, one of the major symptoms is not being able to stop yourself doing things. <coughs> so, uh, un un unable to stop doing things quickly, you're drawn to reward, you prefer immediate reward to delayed reward. So, somebody with ADHD, if you give them a fiver, so there's a fiver there or 25, 25 pounds there, you can have the fiver. Uh, now, or you can have the 25 tomorrow, but almost always take the fiver now because you can't delay response because there's a reward, and a reward makes you feel normal. <laughs> yes, fidgety and fidgeting and restless. <laughs> so, sorry, Mike. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, short attention span and so on. So, all those types of symptoms. Um, there is an interesting way of looking at this as to why somebody has those symptoms. Um, and I'll come on to that in a minute, but. Um, the causes of ADHD, <coughs> genetics is the most important thing, so your family background, the genes you are born with, 75 to 85 percent of all people with ADHD have got a parent who could be diagnosed with ADHD, which is one of the most highly inheritable conditions known <coughs> in mental health. So genetics is a, is a significant part of it, and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, poor sleep is the other thing. You can make, you could make everybody in this room have ADHD-like symptoms by depriving them of sleep, uh, which probably might surprise you. And once we were, a lady here and I were talking earlier, and one of the reasons why ADHD is perhaps more common now is because if you lack sleep, it makes ADHD worse or can create ADHD symptoms. When I was young, and my mother as a teacher always reckoned I, I reckoned I had ADHD or something close to it, I was out running around the streets playing football on the field over the back of the house and so on. But now you can't do that. So what a lot of people do is watch television or play computer games or look at iPads and things like that. Now, screens like on this laptop here, so LED screens, the thin ones, give off a light that is predominantly blue. It's a very high uh, blue uh, wavelength, strength of wavelength in the light that comes off those screens. That blue light is enough to stop your brain producing melatonin, and melatonin is what puts you to sleep. It's the brain's message, it's getting dark, time to go to sleep. So if actually it starts to get dark, your brain starts producing melatonin. So you then sit in front of a computer screen for the next four or five, six hours, there's no melatonin or very little melatonin, which then makes it more difficult to go to sleep. You go to try and go to sleep, you don't, so you get up and have another go on the computer. So keeping the amount of uh, LED screen uh, exposure down uh, it, it wears off for about after about once you've stopped. It takes about an hour for the melatonin to come back again. So keeping away from screens for an hour, or there are two other strategies. One of which is its dose. It depends on the dose of the light you get. So turning the brightness of the screen down helps. The other really simple thing to do is to buy a pair of yellow or orange reading glasses, uh, driving glasses. You can get. I, I got some for uh, off. Amazon, I think it was, for, well, some did anyway, for, for a fiver or something like that. You just you either clip onto your glasses or you can wear them as such. It makes everything look a little bit yellow, but it's not too bad. When you do that, it takes down all the blue light from that end of the spectrum. So the screen looks a little bit yellow, but it's all right. But by doing that, you then don't stop the melatonin being produced, which then gives you a much better chance of going to sleep. So that's a fairly simple thing that can be done. So try and keep away from backlit screens. So uh, now Kindles are okay because they're not, they're not backlit, but iPads and uh, computer screens and so on. So that's just a simple thing that people can do. So poor sleep is, is, is part of it. And there are a few risk factors about mother smoking nicotine in pregnancy, but it doesn't, they're not really very important. No one has shown that diet, for instance, statistically diet makes any difference, nor caffeine drinking during pregnancy and so on. Uh, you know, there are stories about it, but no one's actually proved it at all. <clears throat> so if you have got ADHD, your risks of having ADHD, road accidents are twice as likely. 
Having accidents that cause serious incidents is much more common, serious injuries. You're more likely to have poor or unstable relationships, more likely to be out of work or difficulty in being employed or changing jobs regularly, even if they're going well. Likely to have lower educational achievement, but not because you've got a low IQ, but just because you can't concentrate in class, you can't stick there long enough uh, to understand things. And often, because they're losing concentration, they're thought of as being naughty or troublemakers. So um, that will make a difference to your educational achievements. It's going to take it down. Crime is much more likely, and that's because you tend not to think about the consequences of your actions. So if you want something, you want it, and you, you're going to have it. So if you've got ADHD, you're twice as likely to be arrested, five times more likely to be convicted, 15 times more likely to end up in prison. And uh, these studies um, in Sweden, Australia, and Canada, those, those percentages are the number of people in prison who have got diagnosable ADHD. Now, bearing in mind that the amount of the population is likely to be 1, 2, 3%, that is way, way above that. So it's you're more likely to commit a crime, and you're more likely, much more likely to get caught. Uh, you're also much more likely to be uh, abusing substances, so particularly nicotine. Uh, excess cannabis use is very common, and also well, <coughs> alcohol, and also uh, amphetamines. And very few problems. Very few people with ADHD don't have serious long-term sleeping problems. So it's quite. It's, <laughs> what really annoys me is that, uh, as as uh, Dr. Wilson said earlier, you know how many people at the sort of PCT, you know, the sort of commissioning level, don't think ADHD exists. If you showed them a general medical condition, you know, some sort of form of diabetes or something that had all of these problems associated with it. They'd be pouring money into the treatment, but because it's something in the brain, it starts now. Just pull yourself together, organize yourself. <coughs> uh, so that's, uh, <coughs> uh, that's some of the risks of having untreated ADHD. These are the main drug treatments. Uh, uh, so methylphenidate, or Ritalin, as you probably would, most people know it as, uh, is, the, is the first line treatment. We've also got Lysdexamphetamine, which is similar to Dexamphetamine, so it's one of the amphetamines. And then we've got Atomoxetine, which is uh, a bit of a novelty. It's actually an, a failed antidepressant, but it's, um, that's, that's sort of the um, second, that, that's first line, second line, third line, essentially, most of the time. Um, they're, all, they're all licensed in the under 18s, but only Lysdexamphetamine and Atomoxetine are licensed for use in adults. Uh, which does create a few problems with GPs not wanting to prescribe uh, in adults. Now, okay, there are some different preparations of methylphenidate. I'll, I'll move on to that in a minute, but they're actually very important. So, um, if you have treatment for ADHD with, stimulants, with, with, with medicines, either the stimulants or with atomoxetine, these are the things that improve and have been shown to improve. This is based on uh, a publication in 2012 which looked at 351 studies in ADHD, which lasted for more than two years. So we're pretty, pretty sure these are right. So driving improves, the number of accidents reduces by over a half, because the thing is, if you've got, you've got ADHD, you're okay driving around town, but as soon as you've got to a dual carriageway, you know, you're very easily distracted and lose concentration. Uh, obesity and functioning during the day, nearly everyone improves with treatment on those. Most people get improved self-esteem, uh, substance misuse reduces because you don't need to take self-medication. Uh, sleep improves, relationships tend to improve, and crime is much reduced. Uh, in fact, there's been another study I was looking at a couple of days ago, which I can't remember, but it, it showed it was actually some prisoners in a hospital, in a, a prison with ADHD, and it was looking at their relapse rates and readmission rates and reoccurrence rates. Uh, which dropped dramatically, provided they took treatment and stuck with it. And one of the things that, that Shaw states in this study, it's quite clear that if you take a medicine for ADHD, it's much more effective if you take it regularly, reliably, and stick with it for at least two years, rather than just trying it for a bit and then stopping and then starting again and so on. So that's what we know, and that's proven to work. I would just say that, of course, 
yeah, medicines are, very, are the most effective treatment and the psychological therapies and so on have only been shown in clinical studies to work used with stimulants, but they can't solve the problems alone. So the light part, management, management part, learning how to deal with children with ADHD is, is just as important. But if we can get the medicine right, then everything else can fall into place. Uh, so which is the most effective? Now this is, I'll just, I'm assuming this would be, it's a bit difficult to do these types of information because actually getting all the, you know, getting all the information is actually quite difficult to do. But it looks like if you have methylphenidate, so Ritalin it was the immediate release tablets, it's not available as a sustained once a day thing. The response or improvement means your symptoms drop by at least a half over eight to 12 weeks. So that's not a cure, but it's a measure. The trouble is all these studies have different measures of how well they work. But it looks like methylphenidate and amphetamine really are probably the two, about two in three people, just over two in three people, will significantly improve or respond to those two. Dexamphetamine is possibly slightly more than that. The trouble with that is that it's only available as a tablet you have to take two or three times a day. So of course taking, remember if you've got ADHD, remembering to take something every two or three days, sorry, two or three times a day, uh, oh, sorry, two, two or three times a day is quite difficult, so it's not always that easy. So those, it's about 70%, so it's about two or three people, it's slightly less for atomoxetine. Um, and it was in, in, the, in the studies that use placebo tablets, about one in four people improved. But if you had medicine against placebo against nothing at all, the people who had nothing at all, nothing changed. So, which is always an interesting thing, is that people think placebo is nothing. Placebo isn't nothing. Placebos are only nothing if you think, if you think there's no chance of them working. So anyway, that gives you an idea roughly. So it looks like those two are, those two are pretty much equal to each other. Um, and then about, and if one doesn't work, if you switch to the other, uh, about half the people who switch then improve on the other one. So it's, it's, it's that's pretty good actually compared to, to, to most mental health conditions. Uh, so methylphenidate is a stimulant, it's a bit amphetamine-like. And one of the, th one of the uh, amph amphetamines and the stimulants increase dopamine in the brain. Dopamine in the brain is the chemical messenger which controls motivation, goal-directed behavior, so if you want, if you want something, reward, um, uh, and those types of things. So, it, it's, so if you were, I'm not, I'm not in any way suggesting you do this, but were you to go home and smoke a big joint, <laughs> that would contain cannabis, which will stimulate the cannabis receptors in your brain which will increase dopamine in your pleasure centers. And that's where the reward comes from. If you were to go and have some opiates, so heroin or codeine or something like that, that will stimulate your opiate receptors, which will stimulate dopamine in your reward centers. If you have nicotine, that will affect possibly part of the nicotine receptors, but also releases dopamine in the reward centers. So most of the drugs of abuse increase dopamine in your reward centers, which is the reason why you get a reward from taking it, but also um, you, you're getting a reward from taking it, but also that then means that you then fancy it again when it wears off, so that's where you get the reinforcing effect of taking something again. And one of the ways of looking at ADHD is that maybe genetically people with ADHD haven't quite got enough dopamine. Because you haven't quite got enough dopamine, if you have something that gives you that bit of extra dopamine, you feel normal, you feel right. So actually what you're doing all the time is trying to increase your dopamine levels. So doing exciting things, getting rewards, stealing things, taking amphetamine, smoking, all those things give you more dopamine to make you feel normal. Now as, there was a chap I used to know from the Coach and Horses on Thorpe Road in Norwich, uh, who ran a nightclub. And he turned out he was adopted, and apparently found out his adopted family couldn't cope with him. And that's actually it turned out he's adopted. No, his real father had ADHD as well, so his mum couldn't cope with a father and 
and this this chap. And and I'd realised after a while that he had ADHD. And I said to him, "If you do, you ever have you ever taken amphetamines?" He looked at me like I'd sort of crawled out from underneath the stone somewhere. And said, of course I have. I said, "Why do you take them?" Oh, or when do you take them? Oh, he says, yeah, I, I, I take them when I'm doing the paperwork for my business. So, so I, you, you, he, he took them in order to be able to work, not to feel high, but in order to feel normal. So one of the possible arguments is that actually ADHD, the symptoms are based around trying to give yourself some extra dopamine so you feel normal. And that is what methylphenidate and Listax amphetamine do. They give you that little bit of extra dopamine because it does seem a bit odd, doesn't it? Somebody rushing around all the time. So what do you do? Give them amphetamines. Which for everybody else would make them rush around. But actually it's giving them enough dopamine to feel normal and then stop going for all these rewards all the time. So that actually you could delay and have the 25 pounds tomorrow rather than five pounds today. Uh, <clears throat> one of the lovely things about methylphenidate and this thing, this thing, this amphetamine is that both of them, the effect is pretty quick. So you've got an effect within, uh, often within a few hours, so you know whether it works. Uh, so that's good. So um, what we, we do have extended release preparations of methylphenidate, because methylphenidate itself goes into the body and out again within a few hours. So therefore, you've got to take it two or three times a day. Is it the next slide? Yes. So how do I remember to take Ritalin without having taken Ritalin? which I think sort of sums up that problem. So one of the things that people are trying to do is, is look for ways of not having to take it three times a day. So what we now have are these XL extended release products, which you only have to take once a day, um, which then means you've only got to take it once in the morning and then it covers you all the day. Uh, now, I don't know how many people are on, how many people have, uh, know people who are on these preparations, but one of the, big things I would like to say is that they're different from each other. They're not all the same. Equisim gives you 30% of your dose straight away and 70%, so about a third of it straight away and then two thirds over the rest of the day. Medikinet gives you 50%, so half of it straight off and then the other half is spread over the rest of the day. And then we've got Concerta, which is about a quarter straight away, and then three quarters over the rest of the day. So they're different from each other. But the trouble is, if a GP writes methylphenidate XL, you might get any of those three, and they're different from each other. Uh, it's just a matter of interest. This is, this, this is the Concerta capsule. So in that capsule, there's a hard part to it. You've got a drug overcoat. So the 22% is actually around the outside of the capsule. Then inside, this area, th th there's drug in there and in there. And this compartment, as you soak the tablet in water, in other words, in your stomach, so water goes in, that expands, and then it pushes the methylphenidate out through the hole on the end. Which I think, I think is amazing that that actually works, <laughs> and works regularly and reliably. And it looks very crude, but actually it really does work. It does mean that you can't carve the tablets, the capsules. If you cut them in half, they're actually virtually unbreakable. I know that because the pharmaceutical inspector told me he went to a pharmacy once and found a bloke with a hacksaw in <laughs> one of these capsules trying to cut them in half. <laughs> Don't work. Uh, um, now, there, there are also two other products called Xenidate and Matteride, which you might come across as, which in theory are the same as Concerta. <laughs> they're made by different methods, they're done differently, differently from each other. They're a little bit cheaper, so they're attractive in that respect. And what I would say is there are lots of reports of people switching from one to another and becoming unstable. Uh, I, I, it would take me a while to go and explain the reasons for it, but the amount that actually released over <coughs> how long and so on can vary. So one thing I would say, if you've, if you've got anybody who's taking any, any of these methylphenidate preparations, capsules, always stick the same brand unless you deliberately decide to change. Don't let it happen accidentally. Uh, just to give you an idea, that's what happens if you remember to take methylphenidate twice a day. That's the amount in your blood if you take equacy, so that's your 30% to start with and then there's your 50%. The medikinet, there's all your 50% and then it eases off and then that's your quarter from concerta and then up and down again. 
So you can see there's quite a difference in there. And if you're, if you're used to having you know, that amount <laughs> straight away, and then you only have that amount, it's going to destabilize you, isn't it? So, um, I forget those. So, in fact, the BNF, the British National Formula, which is what GPs are told to follow, now says these preparations may not have the same clinical effect, so prescribers should specify the brand to be dispensed. So I would say, please be careful about any accidental switches and always take your box to your appointments to make sure that it's checked, to make sure it's the same version, the same variety, because it's quite easy for community pharmacists to dispense, quite appropriately, dispense the wrong stuff for you. Because if the prescription says methylphenidate 90 milligrams, you could have any of those five preparations. And that would be quite right, but <laughs> it would be quite legal and correct as far as they're concerned, but it wouldn't be right as far as you're concerned. Uh, so they're not, they're three different release shapes, they're not interchangeable. No, that's right, good. Uh, now, lisdexamphetamine is the other one. This is um, only, this is the new kid on the block, it's been only around a couple of years. And lisdexamphetamine, we also call it LDX because it's easier. LDX doesn't do anything in itself. But when you take it, it's broken down in the body and by the red blood cells into dexamphetamine and lysine, which is an amino acid, don't you worry about that. Um, the advantage of that is that because that, that breakdown lasts quite, takes quite a long time, you don't get an immediate buzz from it, so there's no abuse potential, so there's no reward from it. And also you get a nice smooth blood level over the day, and people say that it just it's gentler. It sort of feels nice and smooth. They get the effect and then it wears off at the end of the day. So uh, they're, they're capsules, you can swallow them whole, you can sprinkle them on food. Injecting it doesn't work. Just in case anybody wants to pass that message on to anyone. <laughs> I'm not looking at anyone in particular. But <laughs> um, because you can inject it and it, it is broken down into dexamphetamine, but it takes exactly the same speed as injecting as it, it does swallowing it whole. So there's no quick fix by injecting it, so it's, uh, which is uh, quite, uh, quite um, a useful characteristic. Um, you can empty the capsules and put them on food. It's pretty much the same idea. Um, so it's 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 uh, it's once a day. It's not easy to abuse. It's quite easy to take. The dosing is quite easy. Uh, you get an effect till about six o'clock. So a nice thing. It's a little bit more expensive than some of the other drugs, but um, it seems to be quite good. Uh, it's at least as effective as methylphenidate Ritalin products. The other one we got is atomoxetine. Or stratera, which is a failed antidepressant. It's not a stimulant. So one of its one of its sort of little useful niches is if you're a sportsman with ADHD, and there are quite a few, you can't take the amphetamines because they're stimulants. Therefore, you get banned. So atomoxetine is a, quite a useful one because it, it's not an, it's not a stimulant. So you can't be you can't be um, banned for um, taking taking stimulants. So people like Michael Phelps, he was, I think he was on atomoxetine for his, uh, his ADHD. I do think that uh, Mario Balotelli ought to be on it as well, actually. <laughs> I've never seen it written down, but it always strikes me that he's, uh, he's got a lot of ADHD characteristics. But I'm sure Ronaldo is. Um, so yeah, it's not abusable because nobody knows they've taken it. And you never abuse a drug you don't know you've taken. You really wanted me to tell you that, didn't you? <laughs> it's obvious, but it's true. Um, so the disadvantages of, of atomoxy is it does take quite a long time to work. So you've got, um, you probably get possibly half the effect in the first week, and then the other half takes another three months. So it's not an immediate, it's not as immediate as the stimulants are. Um, so anyway, that's, that's been around for a while. Um, other things, melatonin is very, helpful for sleep, getting people's sleep patterns back together again. Um, I, you can actually take melatonin for many years. Um, there are some studies in ADHD, particularly with methylphenidate, where youngsters took it for three, two, three, four years, every night. It seemed to work when they stopped it. Um, they didn't seem to get any withdrawal symptoms. Some of their insomnia came back, sometimes it didn't. Uh, you can buy it over the internet, 
uh, because GP is not very keen on prescribed, because the only product you can buy, so the only product that can be prescribed by GPs easily is only for the over 55s. Whereas in America, you can go into a health food store and buy melatonin. Just beware, some of the melatonin products come from animal sources. So you can get artificial melatonin, but some of the animal ones people aren't very keen on. Um, now, guanfacine, which must be the world's worst name for a drug, I think. I always think guano whenever I say that. <laughs> <laughs> there must be a joke in there somewhere, but I won't publish it, I'll say it. Um, that's, that's a new drug for ADHD, which is going to come out in January. Uh, it only, was only found out on um, mon a Monday evening, uh, Monday of this week. Um, that, I, have, I haven't got all the details of that yet. It's been used in America for quite a few years. It's an add-on to stimulants to, to help improve the response. <coughs> So uh, yeah, those are the uh, those are the other products available that might be used sometimes. Um, so uh, so that's that's the ADHD drugs. A quick run through them. So what we the thing about ADHD drugs, we know they work. Uh, they're not perfect. Um, you need to do other strategies at the same time, but they do. If you genuinely have got ADHD, then they do significantly reduce the symptoms. But they're much better if you do it slowly, regularly. Uh, and slowly, regularly, and commit to the treatment rather than messing about with it. So, just briefly, autistic spectrum disorders, limited medicines, really pretty limited in what, what they can be used, what they can help. We know that some low dose antipsychotic drugs, and don't get too tied up with the antipsychotic, maybe major, major tranquilizer actually in these cases might be the better term almost. Uh, but so, l low doses can sometimes help. Uh, people, particularly agitation and aggression and sort of arousal and so on, um, just as a general sort of calming atmosphere rather than treating any psychosis as such. A uh, therapeutic window means that a therapeutic window means if you increase the dose, sometimes you get the, the effect increases, and then as you increase the dose, so it actually starts to decrease. So just be aware that often people with AS, with, with autism, so on, can be very sensitive to the drug. So you start on a low dose. If you increase it and it doesn't seem to be work quite so well, then come back down rather than increase the dose. It's a great temptation to sort of keep increasing the dose and see what happens, um, which you can do, but if nothing helps, then you know, go back down again. The only drug that's actually really licensed and approved is Risperidone for relatively short-term treatment in young people for irritability associated with autistic disorder. As a couple of big reviews decided that it doesn't, it doesn't help the main symptoms, but it can help with irritability and aggression, but really only at sort of 0.3 to 3.5 milligrams a day. Now, if you had, if you had um, psychosis or schizophrenia, you'd probably be on four, six, eight milligrams. So it's much lower dose than you would normally expect. Um, so yeah, it can have a moderate effect, so it might help a bit a part of the overall treatment, but it's not, um, uh, it's certainly not, a, not a, a miracle cure or anything. Um, Aripiprazole or Abilify is the other drug that's not licensed in the UK but is in the States. Similar types of things but using, again using low doses. Um, so um, if somebody's got ADHD as well as autism, then methylphenolate can sometimes help the ADHD parts of it. but. Being a stimulant, it can make some of, can make some of the uh, tantrums and moods a bit worse. Antidepressants help, possibly, but in fact, really probably not, because that's a large. That was an analysis of all the studies there are. Really came to the conclusion there was little evidence that they worked. They might help some repetitive sort of obsessive compulsive type behaviours, but generally they probably don't help very much. Um, yeah, there's a lot of other things there, forget those, and those. Oh, secreting, that definitely doesn't work. Anybody ever come with this? I don't, know, I don't know where this myth came from, but there are 16 studies which show that secreting does not work categorically. So don't spend any money on it. <laughs> so, um, I would say just in conclusion about medicines, if, you've got, if you're taking medicine, decide what you're trying to do with it, what you're trying to help, 
choose a way of measuring how it works. Um, if you get some effect, try a high dose. If it, that, if it doesn't, if you don't, then if some person doesn't then improve or it gets worse, go back down again. <laughs> Remember, we're all individuals, so I can stand here and spout about clinical studies. If something works for you, I wouldn't knock it. If it works, don't knock it. And the other thing you can do if you've got ADHD is wear a T-shirt. So mm -hmm. these are some of the T-shirts that I've come across. <laughs> I was like, I can't keep calm, I've got ADHD. I think that probably just about sums it up. Uh, so, start, my conclusion is you start all medicines gently, start slowly, go slowly, uh, try and get the right dose, manage side effects if you can, uh, take them reliably and regularly, don't mess about with medicines. It's a bit like having a car, putting your foot on the brake and then the accelerator, brake, accelerator, brake, accelerator. If you're stopping and starting drugs all the time, the car's jerking its way along. So it's much better for you. Start slowly, build it up, and then stop slowly. Stopping quickly is a bit like stopping a car without your seatbelt on. You can do it quickly, but it hurts, and it can cause damage. So treat the drug with respect, Treat your brain with respect. Uh, try and get the best dose for you. Symptoms didn't occur overnight. They're not going to disappear overnight. So they may well take weeks or months of a treatment to start to improve. I uh, said most of that already, haven't I? Yes. And if you're coming off a of medicine, do it gently and with support. And if you go to the Choice of Medication website, there's a four-page leaflet there which will help somebody all the questions, you, all the things you need to think about. You can come up with a little score about how likely you are to become ill again or get your symptoms back. So that's on there which you can print off, it's free. Um, and that will give some of an idea, you know, looking at how, how ill were you, how ill were, what's the likelihood of becoming ill again, how serious is it and so on. So little things to think about just before deciding I'm going to come off, come off something. Uh, said all that. So, uh, and finally, the Choice of Medication website has got loads of stuff on everything, particularly ADHD, including adult ADHD, which, as we know, some people think doesn't exist. Uh, there's loads of stuff there. Uh, so if you go to the Trust website, find help, learn more about medication. Um, there's at least 13 to 20 questions on each condition. Uh, and you can look up there, they're all linked in, all the different treatments are in there, including drugs. If you click on any of the drugs, it takes you through to that drug. And then there's 30 questions and answers on each drug. Uh, we've got leaflets you can print out. We've got translations. So let's, let's that. We've got some ones that are a bit more appealing to younger people. Uh, we've yeah, got those. Uh, we've got one-page leaflets as well. We've got... Um, translations. We've also got our handy charts which are on there. I've got one of these. No, it's already reserved, isn't it? <laughs> so, there are some of these available, which are a way of uh, uh, comparing all the drug treatments for each of the conditions. Uh, I've only got one of these at the moment. I don't know whether the pharmacy uh, are going to do any more, but they're all available free off the website and they're always the most up-to-date versions of them. Um, uh, and that's it. So what I would say, whatever you do, always give 100%. Uh, unless you're donating money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.